Okay, so thank you very much and thanks the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So I will present some uh, recent joint work that uh, I obtained in collaboration with Francesco Veneziano, that is here, and Umberto Zanier, about uh, um, uh, Eliadic continual fractions. So the first question was, so if you take the usual continual fraction that, as you all know, is a, a classical um, uh, argument in Diophantine approximation because it encodes a lot of properties of the number you are expanding. Um, so the idea is uh, how do you um, give a definition for continuous fraction in p edX in l edX in this case, and uh, what can be seen about periodicity and the usual properties of the continuous fraction. So just as a warm up, I will recall the classical case. So so as you all know, when you take real numbers, the continuous fraction is always an expression of the form a naught plus one over a one plus one over etc., where the ai are integers. And uh, if you start from a real number, alpha is a real number, how do you compute the expansion in a continuous fraction? So there is an algorithm that is pretty simple. That is, you take a naught as the floor of alpha, and then you take alpha one as one over alpha minus a naught, if of course alpha minus a naught is different from zero, otherwise you stop. And in this way you write alpha is a naught plus one over alpha one, and you go on. So you take, you take uh, a n plus one equal to the floor of alpha n, and you take alpha n plus one as one over alpha n minus a n if, of course, alpha n minus a n is different from zero. Otherwise, this means that the procedure stop. Okay, so just to make a quick example, let's try to compute the, so pick alpha equal to the square root of two, and you want to compute the continuous fraction. So the first term will be the floor of the square root of two, that will be one, and then you have that alpha one will be one over square root of two minus one, that is just square root of two plus one, and uh, if you compute, you have that a one will be two, that is the floor of this guy, and then alpha two is equal again to one over the square root of two minus one. And so you see now that alpha two and alpha one are the same, so if I compute again, this means that I will again obtain two, and this means that the continuous fraction is periodic. So we just have that the square root of two can be written as one plus one over two plus one over two, etc. And I will denote this expression by one two, to denote that two is the periodic part. Okay, all right. And just to fix uh, some terminology, these for me will be the partial quotients. And the alpha i will be the complete quotients. Okay, so. If you want now to generalize this definition to L addix, so you see that you need a good definition of the integral part, okay? And what is the integral part in this case? It's just a number that is integer that lets your alpha minus the integral part of absolute value less than one. And 
you see that in the El Adi case, there is not, not a canonical choice for a number such that the El Adi capital value of the number minus the integral part is less than one. And in fact, there are several definitions given by Mahler, Schneider, and Rubin and Brokin that try to uh, give so several definition of uh, the the LAD continuous fraction depending on how to choose how you choose the integral part. And we will focus on the definition given by Rubin that was given around the 70s because uh, is the most so is the closest one to the real case. So in the definition of Rubin, what is the integral part? Okay, so first of all, in order to have a simple continuous fraction, so with the numerators equal to one, we have to choose the, the uh, Eliadic integral part of a special form. And the special form will be that the integral part will be a number a of the form r to over l to the e, where e is minus the valuation of alpha. With vl, I will denote the Eliadic valuation of alpha. So in this form, so the Eliadic integral part given by Rubin is the following, so uh, you have so you have alpha in QL and the Eliadic integral part that I will denote by this symbol is the only a in z of one over l with a between zero and L, such that the Eliadic absolute value of alpha minus A is less than one. Okay, so I'm just taking A of this form with A between zero and L, such that the Eliadic integral part does exactly what I need to uh, perform the same algorithm. Okay, so with this definition, I can have so the same, I can perform the same algorithm. And so instead of taking alpha in R, I will take alpha in QL and then just plug in the Eliadic integral part. Okay, so I take A not the Eliadic integral part and then alpha one as this. And again, here I take the Eliadic integral part. Okay, so. Just to make an example, if you take, for example, <coughs> in, uh, so you take L equal three, and you take alpha equal to five over six, just some rational number, and you write it in the triadic expansion, this will be three to the minus one plus two plus some other terms, and the Eliadic the integral part is just this guy, okay? So the A naught, the triadic integral part of alpha in this case is just three to the minus one plus two, that is seven over three, okay? And if you do the computation, you see that this minus this has triadic absolute value less than one. Okay, so, um, there is a fact, so this gives a good definition of uh, the continuous fraction, namely, if you take the convergence, <coughs> Pn over Qn that are just the truncated continuous fraction, so this symbol is just to mean A naught plus one over one plus, etc. until the n minus one term. So this convergence form a Cauchy sequence with respect to Eliadic metric, 
And so if we take the limit with respect to the Eliade metric, this will converge to the number that we took uh, at the beginning, okay? So this is a Cauchy sequence with respect to the adding metric. And so if we take the limit, this will converge to alpha. Okay, so I should use this, right? Okay, so now to make some examples, just to show you yeah. some of the differences uh, with the classical continuous fraction. So if we try to compute the continuous fraction of, of five over six, as was the number. So in the case L is equal to three. So we see just the first difference with the classical case, that is that the, um, Continuous fraction of this guy will be of this form. Seven over three, seven over three, and then there is a periodic part, okay? So this means that rationals can have periodic continuous fraction. While, of course, in the classical case, you have that rational as always conti uh, finite continuous fractions. And moreover, in the classical case, you have the famous theorem of Lagrange that characterizes the periodicity of the continuous fraction that says that alpha in R has periodic continuous fraction if and only if alpha is quadratic iteration. Okay, and in this case, so in the case of Eliadic continuous fraction, this is not true anymore. For example, if you take uh, alpha, the square root of 37, so you have to choose one, so I can choose, for example, the one that is uh, congruent to one mod three, and you try to compute this, Continuous fraction, this will be one, five over nine, uh, 16 over nine, seven over three, etc. cetera. And uh, we will show at the end that this is not um, periodic continuous fraction. So you, you can have quadratic points, so quadratic numbers, so number of degree two over Q that doesn't have uh, periodic continuous fraction. So, of course, the first question you can ask is how to detect that uh, a number has periodic continuous fraction or not? And uh, we searched a bit in the literature and we found that this was not known. And so we developed a criterion that is uh, effective uh, to detect whether a number has periodic continuous fraction or not. Okay. So, the necessary condition for the periodicity is pretty simple, and is the same of uh, the real case. So we have the following proposition that says that if alpha has uh, periodic, I will say RCF to denote the Ruban continuous fraction, that is the definition I'm taking, then either alpha is rational or alpha is real quadratic irrational. So with real quadratic iteration, I'm just meaning that uh, the number has degree two over Q, and if you take the two embeddings, so if you take the two embeddings uh, in C, as the number has degree two, then the two embeddings are real, okay? So this is a necessary condition that is quite easy to prove because <laughs> it just comes from the fact that as soon as you have periodicity, 
you have a relation between uh, the complete quotient and the partial quotient, and this gives you an, an equation of degree two over Q. And uh, this, this equation has uh, a real, um, uh, real, rela real um, solutions because uh, it has solution of different sign. Okay, so they cannot be complex. So this is pretty easy. And uh, for the sufficient condition, So you see that now, in order to hope to have periodicity, we have to um, see. So we, we have to study the rational case and the quadratic case. So I will uh, just divide the two cases. So the first, the rational case. <coughs> so as you see, I show you an example of <coughs> a number that has uh, the continuous fraction that is not finite. And uh, as I will show in a moment, the tail, you see that the tail there is eight over three, and this is not the case. So there is a theorem that says that this tail, in the case of rationals, is the only tail you can have. And the reason is simple. No. So where does it come from? This comes from, from the fact that, in general, in QL, if you take minus one over L and you compute the expansion, this can be written as the sum for I from minus one to infinity of L to the minus, L minus one, L to the I, okay? And so if you compute the integral part of this guy, the integral part of this guy is L minus L to the minus one. And if you do the, so if you compute the first uh, complete quotient, this will be again minus one to the minus L. Okay, so this means that if you compute the continuous fraction of this guy, the continuous fraction of this guy will be a purely periodic continuous fraction of this form, okay. And there is a theorem that was already known in the 80s that says that this is the only exception that you can have in the finiteness of the continuous fraction in the Eliadic case. So more specifically, the theorem is the following. Okay, so take alpha of the, fair, of the form A over B in Q. Uh, <coughs> okay, if alpha is not terminating, Ruben continuous fraction, then it is periodic. with periodic part equal to L minus L to the minus one. So exactly what, what I was saying, the tail that you can have is just of this form. So every rational has a periodic continuous fraction, but the tail can be just this. <coughs> and moreover, Uh, the length of the preperiodic part so of the pre-period is bounded by this quantity so 32 L <laughs> maximum of absolute value of A, I, absolute value of B. Okay, so just a remark. These are standard absolute 
yeah, yeah, the standard absolute value. Okay, so as a remark, so the first part of the theorem was already known by a theorem of Lau Akosol from 85, but it didn't give uh, uh, like a bound to understand when the tail starts, okay? So it just knew that the tail was of this form. And in the same paper of Lawakosol, La actually, he asked whether one can find, uh, instead for uh, quadratic irrationals, an effective criterion in which uh, you can detect whether um, a quadratic irrational has or doesn't have a periodic continuous fraction. Okay, so let's go to the quadratic case. So the quadratic case is a bit trickier. Okay, so uh, we said that in order to have uh, periodicity, we have to start with a real quadratic irrational. Okay, so if I pick alpha in QL, a real quadratic irrational, okay, I can write it in this form, alpha equal to B naught plus delta over L F naught C naught, where B naught C naught and F naught are all integers. The square of delta, this capital delta is bigger than zero because I'm taking something that has real embeddings and uh, not necessarily square free. And uh, uh, L does not divide C naught. Okay. So now, without, without loss of generality, one can assume that L does not divide the uh, uh, great common divisor between B naught and delta. This is not restrictive. And uh, eventually replacing uh, C naught, B naught, and delta by some multiples, I can also assume that C naught divides the quantity delta minus B naught square. Okay, why I need these two conditions? Because if we are in these two conditions, <coughs> then one can prove that when performing the algorithm, the alpha i, so all the complete quotients, as this form, so as the same form, so they can be written as bi plus delta, the same delta, over L F I C I, where the sequences bi, f i, and c i satisfy some recurrence formulas that are the following. So we have that bn plus bn plus one is equal to a n l f n c n where a n is exactly the partial quotient that we have in the algorithm, and l to the f n plus f n plus one c n c n plus one is equal to delta minus b n plus one square. This is for all n bigger or equal than zero. Okay, so. Using this form of the complete quotients, one has the following proposition. That is the following. So alpha has a periodic Rubin continuous fraction if and only if, if you consider the sequence of the bi, this is definitely bounded. So if and only if, definitely, you have that bi becomes less or equal than the square root of delta. Okay, this is quite easy to see from these uh, uh, sequences because morally if you have 
that definitely this is bounded, you have that you have a finite number of ch choices for this guy that gives you finite choices of the ci of the fi and so you have repetition okay from a certain point on because you are just uh, playing with the finite number of possibilities okay but there is this definitely that doesn't give you an effective criterion to detect the the periodicity or not and uh, you have the following fact that this bound is actually related to the real embeddings of your alpha. What, does I, what do I mean by this? I mean this, that if you denote by uh, C of n the number Bn plus the square root of delta over this guy and is conjugate by uh, xi prime. So these ju are just the two real embeddings of your alpha because alpha is of this form. Okay, so you see that this condition becomes that definitely you have that the product of these two guys is smaller than zero. Okay, because it's just, uh, uh, so this gives you that the product of these two guys is smaller than zero. Okay, and so you see that <coughs> the periodicity is linked to the sign of the two real embeddings of your alpha into the reals. Okay, and so I can state the main theorem that is the, um, the criterion. And so the criterion has two parts. So you have alpha in QL, real quadratic irrational. <coughs> if the Rubin continuous fraction expansion is periodic, then there exists a unique embedding J of Q alpha in R, so that for every n bigger or equal than zero, J of alpha n is bigger than zero. Okay, so you have always one embedding that is positive and one, the other embedding that is negative, if you have periodicity. So conversely, there is an effective constant and alpha, so that if, so, so that either there exists a small n less or equal than an alpha such that alpha n does not have a positive real embedding. Or there exists an one smaller than two, smaller or equal than an alpha such that alpha n1 equal of two alpha n2, and so you have periodicity. So in the first case, of course, from the first part you get no periodicity because if you have periodicity, this means that uh, you always have uh, uh, real uh, embeddings such that j of alpha n is bigger than zero. Okay, and uh, the constant is pretty simple. So if you take t, the floor of the square root of delta, the usual one, then you can find that an alpha is this guy. So the maximum between zero and b naught minus t plus two t plus one delta minus Q 
this plus one. Okay, so uh, you have that, you see that actually the constant depends only on the square root of delta, so it's independent, so it is uniform in the field <coughs> in which you take alpha and it's polynomial in this quantity, okay? And B naught is just this guy. Okay? So in the last minute, I just wanted to show you. So the first example I made of the square root of 37, why this is not periodic. Okay, so if you take again, so the, with L equals three, delta is the square root of 37 congruent to one mod three, okay? Now, if you compute the continuous fraction, you have that the first quotient, the first partial quotient is one, and the first complete quotient is one plus delta over 36, okay? And so in this case, if you compute the two real embeddings, one will be, will be one plus square root of 37 over 36, that is positive, and the other one will be one minus square root of 36 over, 36, over the 37 over 36, that is negative. But if you go on and you perform one other step, you have that the partial quotient is five over nine and alpha two is minus 19 plus delta over again 36. And in this case, you see that both the two embeddings are negative, and this is enough to show that the, so you have that C2 and C2 prime are both negative, and this means for the theorem that you don't have periodicity. Okay, so I will stop here, thank you. Um, so you say that the uh, PN over QN converges uh, to alpha, and uh, yeah. uh, what is the rate of convergence? Oh, uh, is exponentially in the is exponentially rate in L to something? Uh -huh. I think so. Yeah. Uh, oh, in size, in size. Yeah, it's, you have that, yeah, I remember this is exponentially rate. Am I right? So like the usual algorithm, or the, the algorithm in real case, or? What? Uh, I, I mean the same quality as in, for real continued Yeah, function. yeah, yeah. So uh, you mentioned all these various definitions. So yeah. of, all, of all of these, you took Rubens because it's the most similar to the real case, yeah. right? Uh, but are all these definitions equivalent in the end? No, they are not equivalent at all. For example, if you stick to broken definition, so broken, what does it take? It, take? it takes something that is similar, but instead of taking things between L and zero, it takes the integral part between minus L minus one over two and L minus one over two. And in this case, for example, you recover that rationals, all rationals have uh, finite continuous fractions, but uh, still you don't have the periodicity for uh, quadratic irrationals, and it's not known um, some uh, definition in which you have that all quadratic irrationals have uh, periodic continuous fraction. The other definition of Mahler and Schneider that is the same is uh, it's just that you are taking uh, A that is uh, in Z, but in that case you don't have simple continuous fraction, but you have uh, a composite continuous fraction. But if you change uh, the integral part, you can change actually the behavior of the, of the continuous fraction. So you also so you are not equivalent. did consider the periodicity of these other yeah. kind of Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
additional questions? Yeah, I, I also have a question about the representatives. Yeah. So, um, wouldn't Teichmiller lifts be a canonical choice of representatives? So you take the um, L minus first roots of unity in ZL. Okay. And they precisely represent um, together with zero. Yeah. The class. Has anyone ever looked at? No, we didn't. Uh, but we could. Yeah. No, we didn't do it. Yeah, but it could, in principle, change the behavior of the. The continuum first. So in theorem two, do you have a bound on the non-periodic part, like you had also? Oh, the, the uh, bound of the non-periodic part is given by the same n alpha, because okay. you have to n alpha is just the constant in which you find the bound. We don't have a better bound, like. You can uh, adjust alpha in a better way, and the constant n alpha becomes a bit smaller, but it's just technicalities. Uh, but n alpha gives you the same uh, bound for the non periodic part because you, you find the repetition in exactly n alpha steps. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yes. So it's again a question about this uh, definitions or mm -hmm. choices. Uh, <coughs> in the Pedic case, do you have? I mean, in the, uh, in the Archimedean case, you have this uh, nice property that uh, the approximants are the best one with respect to the size of the denominator. Yeah. So you have a similar. Property. You don't have the same. Uh, the same. Uh, so with room and definition, you don't have the same. And uh, I think that there are. Uh, uh, is not known a good definition of the Eliadic continuum fraction in, 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 uh, in, in which you have this uh, this uh, thing. In fact, so the first in uh, so Mahler started uh, to find to study this problem in the 30s, and uh, the, the reason why he started to um, try to, to generalize the continuum fraction was exactly that he wanted the approximant, but this not uh, holds for this. Let's thank Laura.